afternoon again to you all, uh, especially those that have just joined us um, for this webinar on the state of South African fatherhood. My name is Garth Jaffet. I'm the CEO of Heartlines, the Center for Values Promotion, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Heartlines, together with the Center for Excellence in Human Development at WITS and the National Research Foundation, are hosting a series of four webinars on men, masculinity, tease, and fatherhood over the next four weeks. A special thank you to them for this very valuable partnership. Just to say that this webinar would not be possible without the very generous support from the funding of the Oak Foundation. Now what's going to happen is that Heartlines and Sonke Gender Justice will kick, kick start part one of the series, which sets the context on the state of fatherhood in South Africa. Our first panelist, um, that's Vessel van der Berg, who is the Children's Rights and Positive Parenting Unit Manager at Sonke Gender Justice. Sonke works to create the change necessary for men, women, young people, and children to enjoy equitable, healthy, and happy relationships that contributes to the development of just and democratic societies. He's also the co-editor of the State of South Africa's Father's Report. Um, then after Vessel, we're going to have Latasha triga Slaven. She is the research manager at Heartlines. She led the Heartlines Father's Matter formative research, which was funded by the Oak Foundation who are here with us this afternoon. And she will be presenting the findings from the formative research this afternoon. In terms of what Heartlines is, we create a research-based mass uh, media campaigns and interventions that address key social issues. The Fathers Matter intervention seeks to promote the positive and active presence of men in the lives of children. Now I'm going to invite Vessel to start us off with his presentation. Thanks, Vessel. Thank you, Garth. It is a, a real privilege to be on this um, a webinar with you. And I'd like to start off by uh, firstly congratulating Heartlines on the fantastic work on Fathers Matter. Um, I think it's about four or five years ago that uh, uh, we had the first conversation in the, um, in the Cape Town International Airport and it's truly magnificent to have seen how, how the project has grown in scope and is, it feels like it's only just starting. I have to uh, apologize for the background noise. Um, if you're hearing a funny sound, it is because uh, we are receiving a lot of rain in Cape Town and the um, building management in my apartment is installing new gutters. So that's the funny wine in the background. Um, I will try to uh, uh, not have it uh, uh, disturb us too much if I can. Um, I wanted to highlight something that was mentioned in the promotional material uh, about the webinar today, and there was a reference to um, expert opinion and ex experts speaking on fatherhood. Um, while I may have regarded myself as an expert on fatherhood at some point, uh, that changed very quickly when I became a parent. Um, I, I thought I was an expert on fatherhood until I became a father. My two young children have, have really taught me the, um, the value of uh, having an open mind and, and learning from them. So let me uh, tell you what I'm going to speak about today. Um, I am going to give an overview of the State of South Africa's Fathers Report from 2018. I will refer just to three content points from the report, uh, talking about social fathers, about the uh, importance to think about income and poverty as a, as a factor in co-residence of men with children. And then I will make a brief reference to the benefits of father involvement in the first thousand days of a child's life. It is wonderful to see so many familiar uh, names on the participant list. And um, following the theme of not being an expert, I, I really invite colleagues who are, are who have contributed to this field to maybe uh, help us in the conversation. 
Um, it's great to see uh, Dr. Makusha and Dr. Banya and uh, Linda Richter, of course, and a few others on the call who uh, know much more about these fields than I do. Um, I will then also briefly mention the direction that we are going in for the State of South Africa's Fathers Report in 2021. So let's get into it. Um, the State of South Africa's Fathers is inspired by the State of the World's Fathers Report, which has just seen its third edition in 2019. This report is published by the Men Care Global Fatherhood Campaign, and it is a companion to the Global State of the World's Mothers Report and the State of the World's um, uh, Children Report that uh, UNICEF and Save the Children have produced. So I've put the URL on the slide and if you just Google the State of the World Fathers Report you'll find plenty of links to um, our colleagues at Pramunda and the Men Care Campaign who are producing the report. So the State of South Africa's Fathers Report uh, was launched uh, to be a facilitator of a broader narrative of fatherhood in South Africa. Um, I and I, you know, I was reflecting on the fantastic work that you are doing um, in Fathers Matter under Heartlines, and um, you know, it's it's. I think we share that vision to to really deepen the narrative and to make it uh, uh, as sophisticated as we can. So um, I feel that the participation in um, or the collaboration between Heartlines and Sonke and the HSRC has already to some extent fulfilled this goal. Secondly, we would like the uh, report to be an advocacy document that improves policies and programs that support fathers' involvement. And one way to do that is to establish this report as a longitudinal monitor of various indicators on fatherhood in South Africa, similar to the child gauge, um, tracking some of the indicators on children. So one of those indicators is to track parents' use of parental leave. We have just seen in um, 2019 and in January 2020, the culmination of the advocacy for parental leave for parents that goes beyond the previous uh, uh, routine provision of parental leave only for mothers under maternity leave. So um, we now have parental leave provisions that include parents who do not qualify for maternity leave. And the biggest group of parents in that category are biological fathers. So we have 10 days of leave available for fathers. And um, as we will see later in my presentation, uh, the country is quite skeptical about men's use of that leave. And we hope with the State of South Africa's Fathers Report to publish a report every three years that publishes a set of attitudes and indicators on parents' use of such leave. The slide that's currently on the screen is basically a summary of the policies that have preceded this and that, that have been relevant and pertinent to parenting and to fathers in South Africa. And um, when we uh, developed this timeline, a good question was, well, when do we start? We picked 1994, but as many people know, you know, it goes right back to even the Glenn Gray Act, you know, back in the day in terms of both negative and positive uh, effects on parents in South Africa. So um, this picture that was also on the front slide is an image of a grandmother who lives in Kailicha in Cape Town. Her name is Alison Daka. And the picture was taken by the photographer, Eric Miller. And as Sonke, because we are very excited about men's involvement in gender equal parenting, in domestic work, in care work, um, we were very happy to see an image like this. It was, however, when Eric explained it to us, um, I was surprised to hear that uh, the grandmother is the head of the household, and this is her son. The baby on his back, is not his child, it, a biological child, it is his sister's child. And in such a resource constrained environment, all hands on deck are necessary to help to do the care work and the domestic work in the house. And what we discovered when we collected the available statistics on the state of South Africa's fathers for the report was that this image is really representative of the majority of households in South Africa which are female-headed and more often than not have an adult man as a member of the household. 
What is interesting is that of the men who live in households, which make up 71% of the adults that children live with, 36% of children live with their biological father in the same household. That's a very familiar statistic. We have heard that in television adverts or in previous reports, um, you know, the white paper on families, the report from the South African Institute on Race Relations in 2012, um, the, of course, the uh, Baba Men and Fatherhood in South Africa. The statistic of about 36% of children who live with their biological fathers has often been cited as an indicator of fatherhood in South Africa. It is an indicator of fatherhood, but it is by no means the only indicator. It's also really important to think about the other 35% of, child, of children who live with an adult man who is not their biological father. Um, so if you look at the whole picture, children, most children actually live with an adult man in the household. Consequently, my first content point is to highlight the importance to think about social fatherhood. I further want to belabor the point by just uh, uh, adding two dimensions to this uh, focus that we have on children's uh, uh, co-residence with fathers. This uh, slide shows the statistic that we are very familiar with. It has often led to the incorrect interpretation that two thirds of children grow up without a father. Um, the fact is that 35% uh, of children in addition uh, live with men who are not related to them, who could be father figures. And then of the non-resident fathers who do not live with their children, um, some are involved. Uh, as you know, if we follow the work of um, Dorit Posel and uh, Davy and others, that involvement is not as high as it should be. And from the time use studies that uh, uh, Debbie Badender and Stats A have done, we know that for every one hour of domestic care or care work that is unpaid that a man does in South Africa, a woman does an equivalent of eight hours of unpaid care work. So what's clear is that the level of involvement of men in children's lives is not sufficient. Um, however, we do not know uh, uh, in that corner where we're talking about non-resident fathers who are not related to children or men who do not live with children. Some children have support from men who are not their fathers who do not live with them. We don't know enough about that. But I return to my uh, 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 point that I wanted to raise, which is that we need to investigate if we want to improve children's lives, we should investigate and learn more about the involvement of men who are not related to children, because we know more about fathers than we do about the men who live with children who are not related to the children. So um, hence I have highlighted that. Then another, to move to another point, um, uh, in addition to the focus on social fatherhood, um, if you look at the co-residence, which um, was drawn from the household survey, um, the breakdown by race is, uh, is quite uh, familiar to many of us, I would say again. Um, I have to qualify the use of the racial categories. Um, we made a proviso and a qualification in the report that we find the, the need to categorize in the historical categories um, we do find that problematic as uh, social psychologists or social scientists who want to move ahead in the country. Um, but if we wanted to get a picture of the impact of the history of the country on uh, parents and children today, we unfortunately have to resort to the categories that Stats is a uh, utilize. We did change the, um, the, the naming of the category that Stats is a uses as African to black. Um, uh, because uh, colored white and Indian people also may identify as African, but it's still problematic. Um, you know, many people who might be regarded as so-called colored or so-called Indian uh, might identify as black on the other hand. So let me just uh, make kind of a big proviso on the race is complex. Um, nevertheless, if, if we look at the, the graph, we will see that uh, for black families, it's mostly in the black families that children um, live with mothers only. 
And uh, there's been lots of publications and work done on this over the years that shows a significant impact of the um, migrant labor system and the exploitation of black bodies and black labor by the apartheid regime, which still carries on to this day that migrant labor still mostly affects uh, black families. Um, so it's not surprising that uh, those families mostly have, uh, uh, it's mostly in black families that children live with their mothers only. Um, what is interesting, however, is to um, see that in the, if you look at the co-residence of children by income, um, in the top uh, in quintile, the wealthiest 20% of families in South Africa, um, the racial categories are uh, really close to each other. So for white families in that category, uh, the co-residence of children with both parents is 71%, and for black families, it is 68%. So that leads us to conclude that income may be much more of a, 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 a important factor or a, a, a correlated factor in terms of co-residence of children with fathers than race. Um, and that also uh, gives us an indicator of thinking seriously about the, the, um, the links between, between money, economy, poverty, and fatherhood in South Africa, which I think also comes up in some of the findings that uh, Natasha and the Heartlines team found. Um, the relationship between money and fatherhood is a really important one to keep track of. So then, um, finally, I just wanted to um, highlight this slide, which um, shows the benefits of father's involvement in the first thousand days of a child's life. Um, uh, especially in the last few years, we have seen a lot of research interest and also a lot of advocacy work done by various uh, state departments um, and uh, non-state entities the uh, DG Murray Trust have uh, supported a lot of fantastic work to really uh, 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 increase the investment in the first thousand days of children in South Africa um, with a range of good outcomes for employment, for um, contribution to society, et cetera, of children who have a, a good care um, and I would reference good care as uh, the nurturing care framework that has also recently been released as a great framework of the five categories of what we mean by good care. Um, it's, it's, if you want to be strategic, you, would, you need to invest in the first, uh, few, uh, year, first two years of a child's life. Um, having said that, we also share that goal in terms of uh, if we want to have fathers uh, involved with their children's uh, development and life. Um, uh, I refer to point number eight here, long-term involvement between father and child. We are increasingly seeing that if there is an emotional bond or an attachment formed between a baby and a father, the um, involvement of that father in the child's life is, uh, is more likely. Um, it also works the other way around. So. Um, this is quite pertinent to the maintenance debate um, in South Africa, where if we want to see a father's uh, financial support for a child, uh, having an emotional connection with the child is a really strong motivator for that father to remain a supportive of the child. But on the other hand, uh, uh, many people are saying that if I am supporting the child financially, I would like an emotional connection with the child. So it, it works both ways. And um, I, I choose to frame that in a positive way. Um, it has been framed in quite negative ways, but it is also an opportunity to see for um, involving fathers more in children's lives, even if they do not live together. So um, I'm not going to talk about each of these uh, items. That was the one that I thought would, would be a, a, a really important uh, one to reflect on. Um, let me uh, just uh, briefly cite the policy recommendations that the State of South Africa's Fathers Report in 2018 arrived at. Um, and four of them were to enact the parental leave provisions, which have consequently happened in 2020. Um, and we are very happy to have seen the implementation being uh, uh, enacted as from, there was a delay on the implementation. So it was nice to see the implementation begin this year. Um, 
uh, in one of the seminars, I believe it's the third one, Garth, um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Zaurib Khan, will speak about um, a main use of the child support grant. And I think uh, the promotion of that grant to men is a really important imperative for us. I've spoken briefly about the need to uh, think a bit more uh, deeply about maintenance and then also to think about the health uh, facility norms and standards to support men's involvement in maternal and infant health. Then um, in towards closing in the last two minutes that I have left, I'd like to um, uh, uh, announce the uh, State of South Africa's Father's Report 2021. Um, this is one of the draft covers. It is not the final cover. But um, we are very happy that this report will include actual empirical data. Um, we are doing a national survey with mothers and fathers about um, fatherhood, and we will share findings on social fatherhood, as I indicated earlier, um, on understanding father involvement better, on the attitudes and use of parental leave, and again, we will show some recent uh, published research. The, uh, a, a teaser is also to say that the uh, report will be coincide with the launch of a new institution focused on fatherhood research and advocacy, and we are very excited about that. Um, this slide is one from the South African, um, and this is some of the data we will also show that the HSRC has done on their social attitude survey. Um, because of time, I'm just going to refer to the last point, which says that fathers will use parental leave for other reasons not related to parenting. And almost half the mothers and the fathers who responded agreed with that statement. So clearly there's work to be done for um, fathers to be uh, working on doing, uh, uh, using parental leave for parenting. I'd like to highlight uh, the launch of a media kit that we will launch on the 28th of August. And then I just want to end by thanking our donors for the report and especially the Oak Foundation for really sticking to this goal over the last 15 to 20 years. If the Oak Foundation had not done this investment, we would not be where we are now as a movement around the world. So um, it's great to see that expanding into South Africa as well. So that's it from me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Garth. Thanks so much, Vessel. That was a really interesting um, presentation and uh, I think food for thought for a lot of us. I, I certainly picked up on a few very key issues that you raised there. Um, and one that stuck out was the fact that the statistic of close to 70% of, um, of children are growing up without their biological father. And you pointed out that there are in those households are a co-resident man um, around 35 percent and uh, the imperative for us to look at you know this concept of social fathering and how we support those men to support children in 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 the in those homes uh, the other thing that stood out for me vessel was was the concept that income rather than race is probably the biggest uh, driver of of co-residence or or, or joint parenting uh, and certainly in, in our work that uh, Latasha is going to be talking about, money is, is the key issue. Uh, and thirdly, the bonding in the first thousand days um, being predictive of long-term involvement in the child's life or not, as the case may be. I thought were, those were three really interesting points and I'm sure we'll get to discuss them uh, at the end of this when we open this up for questions. So Vessel, thank you so much. Thank you to Sonke for the work that you do for this really valuable report. And we're looking forward to the next report, which I think will help all of us, uh, help families, help men, and help children. Um, so thank you for staying Thanks, with Bob. us. Um, we, we would love to hear your comments, as we said, and please just remember on the Q&A tab, not the chat tab, we'll, comp we'll create a compilation of those questions and I'll, I'll pose them to the panelists at the end of this. Remember that the hashtag is hashtag Fathers Matter ZA. Um, but before we move to Latasha to hear more about the Heartline's Fathers Matter formative research, formative because it leads into our intervention, which we'll be uh, do doing, is we'd like to play for you our Fathers Matter campaign video. 
and it is being shared um, in public uh, today for the first time. So we hope that you enjoy looking at the Fathers Matter Heartlines, Fathers Matter promo video. Father, wow. My memories from that time are kind of just hazy bliss. An average African man does not go to the delivery ward. I must say it was an amazing moment for me. In fact, my son was not ready to come out until I came. Raising a child is not like easy as you see when you see it maybe on television and all that. My dad never misses an opportunity to say, you're gorgeous, you're intelligent, you are everything in a bag of chips. Having my dad around was so important because he taught me what I'm worth from the perspective of a male. My heart was broken for the first time. I spoke to my dad about it, gave me advice. <laughs> Fatherhood is less about doing. It's also a lot more about being. He has given me a lot of strength. My grandpa is very nice. I love him and he's in heaven. A lot of the, the qualities and values that are embedded in me today came from mom and my dad. So if I play the guitar, uh, my dad actually plays the guitar. I like to play music with him. I'm a good footballer, or I think I am. We win against him. I'm scared of going alone at the shops. Daddy, don't leave me. He takes us to fun places. It's a great joy to be a grandparent. It's fighting on the bed, it's running around the house. When he's sleeping, I just bang him on the bum with a pillow. I try to change things. I want the best for my kids. I live with my mom, granny, and that's it. My father was not in the picture because when things ended between him and my mom, went and got married, so he had a whole family of his own. He had made no effort <laughs> to try and find me, you know, was I not worthy of being found. My sister and I grew up with my mother and my brother, he was with us until primary school and then he went to go live with my father. At the age of 15, my family basically exploded. As an intimate ongoing presence, he disappeared from my life at that point. My father had been present in my life, no ways. I don't even know him. My dad, he spent much of his time in Johannesburg, seeking for a job. I was still young when he moved from Venda to Johannesburg. He struggled to get a job. Luckily enough, uh, unlike some of my siblings, I was introduced to my father. Yeah, he would come to the yard, say hello, and, uh, and, and, and that was it. that I do with offenders, you can see that there's a huge gap that is missing. Like you see that a father figure is needed for them to be better persons. I don't remember much of my childhood and I think it's mainly because my mom died when I was about five, five and a half. Yeah, I think I was 12 and my dad got remarried and that's when things got really rocky. I was pretty convinced that all families were doomed to failure. When he was born, it was an amazing moment of being there in the delivery ward, seeing him come into the world. Why would a father abandon their own seed like that? Such a, a beautiful miracle. My mother was overseas for 
most of my childhood, so my dad basically became my primary caregiver. We had a, a, an awful three-year period where my dad and I didn't speak to each other. The thing I learned about that is it's never too late to rebuild relationships that are damaged or, or, or broken. I'm still making peace now. I mean, I have a wonderful husband with two children and I watch my daughter and how she is with her father and that is part of making peace for me. My dad is, he's a life changer. God, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of being a father. If I could be a tenth of what my father was, uh, I'll probably be the best father in the world. hope that you enjoyed that video. Um, it is the first of a series of, of videos that Heartlines will be producing as part of our intervention. And that is sort of part of our DNA as a storytelling organization, which we believe is, is the key to change. So watch out for those in the coming, in the coming weeks. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Latasha to take you through the Heartlines uh, Fathers Matter formative research. Um, Latasha, over to you. So thank you for the opportunity to present the Heartlines Father Matter uh, formative research. And as, every, as Garth said earlier, this um, research would not have been possible without the funding from the Oak Foundation, which we are really grateful for. I just want to start off with some background. Global literature highlights that children without positively present fathers are at a greater risk for poorer emotional, social, and academic attainment. Even before the birth of a child, the father's attitudes regarding the pregnancy, behavior during the prenatal and birthing period, and the relationship with the mother may indirectly influence birth outcomes. In early childhood, studies show that school-aged children with good relationships with their fathers were less likely to experience depression, to exhibit disruptive behaviors, or to lie. Overall, children with actively present fathers or father figures were far more likely to exhibit positive social behaviors, su succeed in school, and attain employment and success later in life. Outcomes of children with absent fathers were much poorer, such as being more likely to end up in poverty or drop out of school, become addicted to drugs, have a child out of wedlock, or end up in prison. It's important to highlight that these are merely risk factors, and growing up without a father, it's not as if these children are destined to have these outcomes. In South Africa, the nuclear family is not the norm. Majority of children grew up in single-headed households, as it displayed by Vessel earlier in the earlier presentation. And children predominantly live with their biological mothers, and in many cases with grandmothers. Many children are born out of wedlock, and when we look at birth certificates, we see that there is lack of paternal details. Fathers and mothers are also often living with partners who are not biologically related to the child themselves. HIV has played a huge role in family structures and has resulted in num a number of single-headed families. Gender-based violence and unemployment are two rising epidemics in the South African environment and are widespread and common in many households. We know that unemployment is growing and it is a, re a reality for many South Africans. In South Africa, the historical context of apartheid has damaged the structure of family life. Without the ability to own land and live close to their low paying jobs, many African men were subjected to the migrant labor system. This took them away from their families for months or years at a time. This is still the case for many South African men who are forced to leave more rural areas for, and seek employment in the cities. Geographically disrupted families are still the norm for many South Africans. With this as a backdrop, the Heartline's Fathers Matter formative research set out to answer four key questions. To describe and gain insight into what fathering 
and being fathered looks like, to determine the attitudes, beliefs, and practices around fatherhoods, to identify and understand barriers and enablers to father participation, to understand the impact of father absent and presence. We undertook a qualitative research methodology that consisted of focus groups, key informant interviews, and case studies. The focus groups were conducted um, in four provinces, in Pumalanga, the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, and Gauteng. All focus group participants were over the age of 18 and consisted of both males and females. The focus groups and the qualitative interviews were, for, were grounded in the programmatic theory that sought to solicit personal experiences from the participants to gain insight and understanding into the context, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and practices. This led to an identification of both barriers and enablers to father participation, and ultimately to a deeper understanding and definition of what it means to be a father in the South African culture. The next few slides will detail the findings from the formative research study. The research study identified four types of biological fathers. They were the present father, the present absent father, the absent present father, and the absent father. The present father is a father that was physically in the household as well as emotionally um, available and present in the child's life. The present absent father lived within the household. He was physically present, but emotionally um, absent and unavailable. The absent present father was a father who did not live within the household and often didn't see the child on a regular basis, but was still emotionally engaged and present in the child's life. And the absent father was one who was neither physically present or emotionally present. In many cases, children or participants identified as knowing who their absent father was. They knew where he's, he lived, but they had no interaction with him whatsoever. The study also identified six key barriers to being active and present. These were institutional and system, systems barriers, such as the legal system, the healthcare system, and the education system unemployment and the inability of men to provide financially to support their families, interpersonal relationships between mothers and fathers, as well as between fathers and extended families and the community, for definitions of masculinity that were steeped in gender norms and gender roles, environmental factors such as migrancy and the use of alcohol and drugs, and cultural factors such as paying the bola or paying damages or a mother going to live with her family after giving birth. Although all six barriers contributed to men not being able to be active and present, for the next few slides, I'll focus on the three key um, barriers that we found, which were unemployment and the inability to provide financially, interpersonal relationships and the definitions of masculinity. The formative research highlighted that being able to provide defined what it meant to be a father and who could participate as a father. Provision was seen as both an entry and access restricting point for father participation. Participants believed that if you could provide financially, you could participate as a father. Failure to provide led to, led to participation and access being denied. On an individual level for fathers themselves, those who were unable to provide felt ashamed and worthless. This affected their self-esteem, self-respect, and manhood. And this often resulted in their own decisions to stay away and not participate actively with their families. Although many, many participants saw the role of fathers as primarily being one of provision, they expressed a deep-seated pain when sharing stories of father absence. These are some of, the some of the quotes from some of the participants from the, from the focus groups. The family looks up to you as the main man, the protector, usually actually the king of the house, the one who's going to provide everything. You don't become a father merely by having a child somewhere. There are certain things you have to do that, you are that, that are your responsibility as a father. You can't call yourself a father if you can't provide for your child. A father is a father if he can provide. There was also a huge expectation from communities and from families around the burden of provision. A father is expected to support, and that is food mostly. I do see that lately even women do work, but mostly the father is looked upon at this side. Communities expect fathers to be a provider, 
then if you are a good father, you are making sure that your kids do not go to bed hungry. Everything else is a bonus. Participants also used provision as a lens to describe the quality of their father. Participants talked about a father as being caring and loving if he was able to provide, not because he showed any emotion towards them or if he was involved in their day-to-day -day beings. Participants described fathers as being irresponsible, lacking stability, or as good as dead, merely because they were unable to provide. We can all agree that now it's all about money. Money talks. If you don't have money, you will find the gates locked because they know you are coming. You find that they don't even want to see the sight of you. They don't want you because you don't have money. If we can get jobs, we can be better fathers as we will be able to support our kids. In addition, fathers felt a sense of shame and uselessness at not being able to provide. And due to the fact that employment was so scarce, they were stuck in this cycle of feeling um, shame and uselessness. Jobs are scarce. Being a father to your kid is kind of very difficult because at times you don't get enough access because you don't provide. You are not working. Then you are ashamed to see your child. If I can be a good father, I have to have money. So just because of unemployment, I end up like running away. When children ask why you abandoned us, he'll say, I was not working. All the fathers say the same thing, and that is, I didn't work. Participants also felt that fatherhood was transactional. And when you, you provided money, you were given access, or you were able to see your child and interact with your child. And this led many participants to feel as if their fathers were equivalent of ATM machines. Participants felt that participation must only be when you provide money, then you can be a father. If you don't have money, you are not regarded as a father. So to be a decent father, you need to have money. When you don't have money, they disrespect you at home. A father should always be able to provide. Mothers also played a key role in fostering the relationship between children and fathers. In many cases, mothers prevented fathers from fathering, particularly when the father was unable to provide, when the relationship between the mother and the father was poor, and when the father had moved on and had a new wife or a new partner. Conflict within the home was often linked to money, and mothers were seen as belittling fathers who were unable to provide. This often impacted the way in which children saw their fathers and affected the relationship that they themselves had with their fathers. Mothers, as well as their extended families, often acted as gatekeepers to the relationship. And time and time again, we heard the following stories. Yeah, it's useless. Don't bother anymore. You end up thinking, what's the use of me continuing when they keep on shutting me out? So yeah, they, the family, are some of the things that make some fathers not to be involved in the lives of their children. If you have broken up with the father of my child, then I want us to fight over the baby. Even when he says he wants his child, I refuse and I deny him the child and I create a rift between the father and the child. Most of the time, children live with the mothers. I have a 22-year-old son whom I last saw eight years back. I try by all means. I even try to get close to their uncles. I'm in good terms with the uncles. I'm in good terms with the aunt. I'm in good terms with some of the elders, but the mother is the one that is pushing back. Expectations, beliefs, practices around being male are often socially constructed in South Africa. Gender roles define men in terms of being unemotional, unattached, and uninfectionate. In addition, gender norms allocate provision to fathers and caring and nurturing roles to mothers. Showing signs of affections towards children, as well as changing, feeding, and nurturing them, is just not something that is seen to be done by fathers. Many participants highlighted that if, there was no, if men were unable to provide due to the way in which gender played out, there was often no other role for them to play with their children. When you start playing with your kids, culture will say, this one is not a man enough. He's busy with children. And at that time, you try to be around, you try to be around your kids. It has a way of suppressing you by making you feel inferior as a man in the community. I remember walking. I was carrying my son on my back and he was sleeping. I walked past the taxi rank and some women who were in the taxi were shocked to see that. The whole showing of emotion to your kids, a lot of them don't show that. They struggle with that because they think it's not something that is done. 
Participants also described a very complex relationship that involved gender-based violence and provision. And even though participants were aware that gender-based violence was wrong, the ability to provide for their, for their children normalized gender-based violence and made it somewhat acceptable within the household. Hurling insults, beating, being sworn at. I don't know how many doors have been changed at my house. My father was rough. He was a rough person. He had fury, but he bought us things. He would buy you a school, a school uniform. Then you get into a fight with him. He would take back the uniform and burn it. Let's say he burnt it on a Friday and now you have to go to school. He will realize on a Sunday that you don't have a school uniform and he would decide to go and buy you another one. Many of the participants identified as something being missing in their lives because of the facts that their fathers were not around. It's a very sad life because your father was not there. For me, as someone who did not have a father, I would love the small things, like someone to say, I love you, those small things. Especially being a boy and your father is not by your side, you are going to make many mistakes in life. A father is supposed to guide you. It's difficult when you see other children with their fathers and you just wish your father was there. You can see other children taking photos with their fathers and wish that if only you were in those photos. Participants described the yearning for a connection with their fathers. They wanted their fathers to be present, to be active and to participate in their daily lives. They highlighted a difference between being a dad and being a father. Anyone can be a dad, but to be a father, you need to have a relationship or a bond. Being a father is something different from being a dad, according to my understanding, because anyone can be a dad. You can do anything to impress your child, do anything, whatever you can, just to keep the child happy. But if there is no bond or that connection, it all becomes worthless or useless. Adulthood led to perspective and the realization that they needed more from their fathers than just provision. I feel like he owed me something. He was supposed to give me something, not things. That is a father's love. I don't want his money. I just wanted him around. And that is one of the things that he failed at doing. He should be there and play the role of being a father to his children, even when he is not working, or even if he can't afford the maintenance of a child. Create time, even if it's 30 minutes to talk to children, whether he is busy, he should give himself time. 30 minutes, 15 minutes. That would be enough. You can give me a million, but most of the things I need is the bond with you. Like I need you, not what you have. I need you when I'm in need of a motivator or when I need someone who will advise me. So I need you. Participants expressed a wish for fatherhood and they highlighted that they wanted their fathers that could be role models and that they could learn from. A father should be a role model. He should be a good example. Whatever he does, he becomes a figure for the kids to copy. They wanted a father who set a good example. They wanted someone they could talk to, someone who was approachable, and they wanted homes and families based on love and respect. Love goes hand in glove with respect. If there's respect in the house, then there will be love. In the absence of fathers, mothers filled the gaps and played the role of both mothers and fathers. And for many of the participants in our studies, they only knew what it was like to have a mother. However, for some of the participants, grandfathers and grandmothers and uncles also stepped in and filled the role of a father. And this was primarily in relation to provision. For the lucky few um, participants, they had what we call social fathers. And these were pastors, teachers, or someone in the community who had stepped up and taken a keen interest in their lives and had played a role in mentoring and helping them through their, through their lives. When a, for many of our participants, um, when, they, when a father was absent or did not participate actively, they often felt anger and resentful. They often didn't understand why they felt this way until they themselves became fathers. Children become resentful. They carry anger. If this anger bursts, it bursts when you yourself are a father. What happens to you is like you're crying out for everything from your father. You feel like you are also lost or not from this world. You feel like you are nothing. For many of this men, for many of these men, it was at this point that they consciously decided to be different to the types of fathers that they had. They decided to be active and present. These fathers have gone on to be amazing fathers to their children, despite not having their own fathers to role model. 
I would just like to thank the participants for trusting us and sharing their stories, their very personal stories on fatherhood with us. The Heartlines research team, who did an amazing job in the field conducting the interviews and the, and, um, the, the focus groups. The Heartlines Fathers Matter project team, who've supported the research throughout, as well as the Oak Foundation, who without, we would not be, have been able to conduct this research. Natasha, thank you so much um, for that really fascinating uh, presentation. And I think it really complements the work that, that uh, Sonke has done. Um, a number of really fascinating things came out just as being part of this process for the last few years. One of the things that I think we, we all underestimate is the reasons why men are not present in the lives of children. Uh, the, the sort of standard thing of it's a deadbeat dad who's not interested. I think your research certainly shows that there's a whole bunch of barriers, economic, cultural, and others that prevent a lot of men from being present. Um, so that is one key thing. Um, the, I think there's the connection between uh, GBV and provision and, and fathers is a very topical one, that uh, just simply being able to pay the bills gives men the right to abuse uh, a woman in the household. Uh, and I think that obviously is another key issue that, that arose. What, what I think is that we found is the overarching issue, as you pointed out in the research, is the fact that, that men and across cultures, and I think we found that out, uh, see their role as being provisors, provision. And it's not cultural, it's, it's, uh, it's across all, all stratas in society. Um, so I think we, we are going to move on to the Q&A section just to, just to highlight that, in fact, the Heartlines research is the basis for a big intervention. And Pam, in the, our project manager, uh, Pam Lechare, will be talking about that in the fourth uh, webinar. Um, so we are doing this research so that we can intervene. And as Heartlines, one of our key uh, understandings is that we don't understand. And we don't un intervene until we start to understand better. And so over the coming months and years, there will be a range of interventions that are aiming to help men to be more actively and positively present. So keep on following us and supporting us and various partners like Sonke and Oak and others as we really tackle this, this key issue in South Africa. Uh, now we will move to the Q&A section of the webinar. And... Um, I'm, what I've done is that the team have, have picked up on a range of your questions and I'm going to be posing them to our two panelists and um, would invite you to, to answer them. There's also been questions around whether these presentations will be available. Yes, they will absolutely be available. Uh, the video is available already on the Fathers Matter website, which will be live as of tomorrow, fathersmatter.org.za. And please share that. Um, so let's start off with a question um, from Erica Joester. Um, and she asks, and the reasons why 70% of children are growing up without biological fathers. And I think in some ways, both of your presentations alluded to that. But uh, Latasha, maybe you'd like to just take that first question. Sorry, Garth, I lost, I lost you for two seconds. My I just said that uh, uh, Erica Joester asks, what are the reasons why 70% of children are growing up without biological fathers? And I think you, you talked about a little bit about it at the beginning of your presentation, uh, which combination of history, uh, apartheid, other, other drivers, migrancy, and so on. But perhaps you'd just like to spend a few minutes just discussing yeah. that. Absolutely. And, I, and I, you know, I think that the norm of the nuclear family is actually not really realistic in a country like South Africa because of the historical context where we come from. But also around the world, we're finding that the nuclear family is not actually the norm. So um, there are a number of reasons why children don't grow up living in the same house of their fathers. Um, there's the, the historical context, but there is also HIV and AIDS where we have many um, families that are single headed, many children that live with grandparents. Um, there's still a history of migrancy in South Africa with men being forced to to go and find work in places where there is, you know, much more employment from to where they live. Um, and um, there also seems to be um, 
you know, just not a, not, it's just not, many children are born out of wedlock. When we look at birth certificates, we see that over 62% don't even list the father's name. Um, and this is for numerous reasons. Um, so mothers and fathers are just not living in the same household. Thanks so much, Latasha. Um, but just to say as well that both the State of South Africa's Fathers and the Heartline's research report uh, is available uh, online, both at Sonke and at, at Heartline's website. Uh, the next question, um, perhaps you'd like to address this vessel, uh, comes from Marifa Muchemwa, and I hope I pronounced your name right. And he asks, um, I would like to ask on the availability of data on men paying child maintenance in South Africa. I don't know whether you have any, you're able to address that, Vessel. Uh, thanks so much, Garth. Um, Garth, I would like to um, uh, respond in two parts. Um, the first part is I, I just want to uh, maybe repeat something that I mentioned in my presentation about the idea of uh, uh, children growing up without fathers. Um, we don't know how many children grow up without fathers. Um, the 36% of children uh, who live in the same households with their biological fathers, as uh, Latasha pointed out in that very nice quadrant diagram, um, we don't know how many of them are living in the same household but are emotionally absent. Um, on the other hand, in terms of non-resident fathers, we don't know how many non-resident fathers are involved. Um, nor do we know how many uh, non-biological fathers are involved in children. So um, I think those are the types of questions that we want to uh, uh, look at. Um, you know, we, what we do know is that 64% of children don't live with their father, uh, their biological father. Um, my children are not biological children. and They are certainly growing up with a father, for example. Um, so just to, to that, that narrative of growing up with, with or without a father, um, you know, a, a slightly more specific use of language might be uh, to refer to the co-residents. Um, in terms of the, the, the question um, that the, the participant asked, um, uh, could you just repeat that again, Garth? Yeah, it's about child maintenance. Is there any data? Yes, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, you know, data. there's no... No, um, no. I mean, what we what we do know is, you know, so there's a. If you look on Facebook, there is a group called um, uh, 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 Child Maintenance Difficulty South Africa, um, who have got a, a, a membership of about sixty two thousand uh, members on Facebook. Last time uh, I engaged with them, so um, there are. Uh, uh, if you refer to the work of uh, Professor Grace Kuno, she's done fantastic work on. Um, looking at uh, uh, qualitatively at the experiences of fathers in the child maintenance system. Um, to get a quantitative sense of uh, fathers not paying maintenance would require a, an analysis of court records in detail. And that's simply just been too big a project to, to, to take on. Um, we do know that uh, it depends on who you ask. So if you ask uh, father's rights groups, they might say that, you know, they would love to pay maintenance, but uh, they are being, uh, 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 there's, a, there's a barrier put in place by mothers. If you asked uh, many of the single uh, female headed households in the country, they might say, um, you know, the problem is much bigger than we think. So it's a very contentious issue. Um, and I, I consequently, you know, I, I think it's, it's really necessary to do some kind of research that gives us a quantitative sense. But at the moment, I haven't seen a representative study done. Thanks, Vessel. So in summary, it's complicated. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Nick has asked, and, and uh, Natasha, maybe you can answer this. I've been made to understand that uh, 90 to 99 percent of men in prison are there because of an absent father, or if present, a poor role model father figure in their lives while growing up. Do we know if these stats are accurate? And maybe you could just talk a little bit about, um, you know, men in prison or juveniles and and and. Uh, people in prison? So just to say that um, we don't know in South Africa how many men in prison have grown up without a father or a father figure. So the research done on men in prisons and, their, and father involvement has been done in the US. 
um, it hasn't been done here. But we do know from that research that there is a correlation between men in prison and incarcerated and not growing up with a father. Um, but we can't, again, uh, say very much about the South African context because the research hasn't been done here. And I'm not really sure about the 99% um, either. Um, it's not a figure that I, I, you know, I recall offhand from the US research. Um, but it is something we would need to look at. But from, from um, some studies, small you know, conversations had with men who are incarcerated, many did grow up without a, a positive a male role model, um, but it's not something we can definitively give you a statistic for. Thanks, Natasha. I think the US figure was around 90%. And uh, I remember in, in the video, Khosiyami from Heartlines, who works in correctional services, made the comment that anecdotally so many men that he comes across uh, have come from father or, or men absent families. Um, then a question to you, uh, Vessel, from Tabang Mokwena. Um, he says, is, is, uh, to Vessel, is new foundation Vessel mentioned going to support legislation or perceptions in the legal system that leads to mothers having custody by default? So whether, whether the, the bias towards giving women custody is, is there any, any work that has been done on that is, is what I'm understanding. Thanks so much, Goth. Um, so uh, just to reference, you know, the, the, the institution that I mentioned that's going to be launched will be focused on research and advocacy. And um, certainly one of the advocacy spaces is uh, the, the realm of supporting uh, uh, child custody, child maintenance matters. Um, the direction that we think might be most constructive is to see how uh, maintenance offices and um, the social workers who are working on family plans with families can collaborate so that a family plan that is drawn up between parents when parents separate actually reflects a contribution by the uh, both parents that goes beyond only the financial contribution um, so in terms of you know i you know again it's it's such a contentious issue because it's some cases there are certainly uh, instances of uh, fathers who have not been treated fairly um, but on the other hand there are many cases where mothers have not been treated fairly and it is really difficult to make a kind of a representative uh, claim on who is being favored more than the other um, as you would notice in any public conversation about fatherhood in South Africa, that topic often comes up. Um, and we have learned over the years to refer to it on a case by case basis until we have better evidence. Um, so yes, we do hope to work in that advocacy. Sonki already does that kind of work, but um, I, I wouldn't want to favor any party in the particular advocacy. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Anonymous has asked, are fathers being denied their roles because of the relationship with the mother having ended? And I think, Latasha, certainly in the Heartlines research, that was a big area of where the child becomes a pawn between father and mother, um, uh, certainly seems to. Maybe you can just make a very short comment on that, and then I'm going to field yeah. one more question, uh, which I'm going to direct to you, um, to uh, vessel, but maybe Latasha, you could just uh, just well, respond to that. The participants in our um, in our research highlighted that often the mothers were responsible for de denying access when the relationship ended, and they would use a child or use access and participation as a way to get what they wanted. So we heard stories of, you know, I don't hear from them, but when they want something, then I'm the father. When they don't need something or don't want something, then I'm not the father anymore. Um, and, the, and this became, you know, a really a huge barrier to father participation. And we don't want to blame anyone here. It's just the interrelationship between the father um, and the mother that's played a role in actually forming this barrier to fatherhood. Thanks so much, Latasha. And, and then finally, uh, Vessel, a question uh, to you. Do you think that the, and this is from Brenda Goldblatt, do you think that the age that the man becomes a father determines his journey with his child? Um, 
I think that's a really important question. I, um, you know, I, from my own experience, you know, I, um, <laughs> I, I became a father in my early 40s. Um, and I was joking with Garth about the, the, the curve of life energy goes down and hopefully the curve of life wisdom goes up. So which one do you want more of, energy or wisdom? Um, so, <laughs> um, I, but I, I do think it's a really important question in terms of uh, younger fathers in South Africa and especially when it comes to employment and income. Um, uh, where uh, a young father might be more likely to be unemployed um, maybe if they haven't been able to establish themselves in the in, in the marketplace. Um, I, I do think that uh, uh, just to, to also uh, uh, tag on to the conversation that, that's emerging in terms of the, um, the different perspectives from mothers and fathers that um, from men care and from Somke side, you know, we've, we're very much grounded in, in feminist values. But the, um, the, the, the paramount uh, uh, right or access to right at this moment is the right of a child to be cared for by um, uh, at least two competent people who are really interested and caring about the child. So if we talk about fatherhood, for us, we, we, we try and position it as the right of a child to have a father. Um, and to be fathered along with a mother. Um, and that, that, that provides a way forward out of the potential uh, dispute between mothers and fathers in terms of who has a greater right for access. Um, uh, but I, I, I think the research on teenage fathers is really important. Um, the, the, the work by Charlene Swartz, Teenage Tata, is a great uh, basis for that. And uh, we will certainly engage in that in the next State of South Africa's Fathers Report in 2021. Bethel, thanks so much for that. Um, I think in, in all the years that I've been involved in social change and, and, and issues, I've seldom come across, I've never come across an issue that cuts across and touches more people than this particular one. Uh, it, it certainly is. I think, you know, when we ask people, is a mother important in the life of a child, they look at you like you're crazy. Uh, the, I think the evidence is so clear now that the presence of an active, active, positive presence of a man uh, is really important as well to a child's development. And I think we're all exceptionally careful to make sure that we are not undermining the role of the extraordinary women out there that, that raise children single-handedly. And while we know that, um, that these are risk factors, uh, that not having a man is a risk factor, it is not a sentence. Uh, and I think we're in the business of trying to deal with risk uh, rather than making uh, single mothers feel less than. Uh, we want to try and promote and get more men to be positively involved in, in the lives of their children. And so we're going to wrap up this webinar. I, I do hope that uh, you have all found this as interesting as I have. And I'm just going to ask for a closing comment from our two panelists. And I thank you both very much for very insightful and very, I think, very important contributions to, to this field. Um, perhaps I can start with you, Vessel. Um, thank you so much, Garth. Um, you know, I, I, I've been also tracking the, um, the, the webinar chat and the questions, and um, uh, uh, I see Professor Mzikazi and Duna just raised a wonderful question about the, the, the number two and the nuclear family and challenging that. So it's, you know, I really hope that we can access the chat text after the, the webinar as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I want to end where I began, which is to say congratulations, hotlines to influencing a national narrative on fatherhood. I really look forward to, to, to listening in on the webinars as we go ahead. And um, I would invite a, a colleague to also just uh, track the, um, to look out for the State of South Africa's Fathers Report in 2021. I've certainly been inspired by some of the questions and contributions in this webinar to nuancing that report. So it's been really valuable to take some of the, um, the, the points that, that, that colleagues have raised. Um, and I'm, I'm sad that we can't address all of the questions, but uh, hopefully the, the research that we will produce together can do that as we move ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Vessel. And again, we appreciate the work that you do and, and the contribution that you've made here. Thank you. And Latasha, a final word from you. I'd just also like to say thank you for the opportunity to present the Father's Matter research in this sort of a format. 
um, it's a first for us to present to present this way. Um, and it's it's really been an amazing journey for Heartlines to see the way in which people have embraced the research and our findings. And again, also monitoring some of the comments on the chat and our full research report is available. Um, but this is really um, what we like to call research for action. So please, you know, this is not the end of the, the Heartlines process, but rather the beginning um, as we link to our campaign, Fathers Matter, um, and also the interventions that we develop going forward. Thanks so much uh, to you, Latasha, and to, again, to Vessel. I'd also like to just pay tribute to the people behind the scenes uh, who've made this possible. So Pamela Khare, who's the program manager at Heartlines for Fathers Matter, to Livu, who has done a lot of the uh, moderation of, of getting things ready, uh, to Andile, who's the technical whiz behind making sure things work. Um, so thank you to all of you. Um, just to remember that this is a series of one of four webinars on men, masculinities, and fatherhoods over the next four weeks. So we're week one of four. Uh, it's in partnership, uh, as we said, with the National Research Foundation and the uh, WIT Center for uh, Excellence in Human Development. And um, next, next week, same time, we have Shane Norris from the Center for Human of Excellence in Human Development at WITS, who will moderate Becoming Men, Overcoming Toxic Masculinities in South Africa. And the two panelists are both from WITS University, uh, Malosi Langa and Mzikazi Nduna um, will be our two panelists for next week. Uh, this webinar is recorded and a link will be made available for everyone who didn't uh, attend. And just to remind you, please follow uh, the hashtag Fathers Matter ZA. Join our Twitter chat from 7 p.m. tonight at Heartlines ZA. And if there are any other insights that you want to share, also tag at Sonke Together, at COEE -E Human, at NRF underscore news for further conversation. And um, we very much, as I say, would encourage you to access these reports and engage with us and we will definitely be sharing all of these findings with you and I look forward to uh, embarking on this important journey with you. So, so thank you all and uh, have a good late afternoon uh, and a fantastic evening. Thank you so much.